Welcome to Han El Khalili in the heart of Cairo. I'm François Picard for this third in our series devoted to Egypt's first election since the fall of Hosni Mubarak. Behind the gates of this 10th century mosque, the world's oldest university, Al Azhar, where all of Sunni Islam turns for thought and guidance on core spiritual matters. No wonder that it's here that Barack Obama came to give his speech to the Arab world. That was in 2009. At the time, Hosni Mubarak's reign seemed eternal. Now that he's gone, we're going to be focusing on what it means to be an Egyptian with young people who study much more than theology, all of the major arts and sciences, what it means to be an Egyptian, and what is the common bond that unites this nation. First of all, I am proud to be Muslim, which is the most important thing. Second, I'm proud to be Egyptian. Thirdly, I'm proud to be an Arab. And fourth, I'm proud of being African. 70% of Egyptians are with religion and with Islam. For them, Islam is the solution. And this is their slogan. We want fair and Islamic foundations. We don't want tyranny. We don't want dictatorship. We want democracy, freedom and justice. Diversity, minority rights, core issues in this nation of 85 million. This is the working class district of Mbaba. Even in an overwhelmingly Muslim neighborhood like this one, you still find Coptic Christian churches. In a nation where nearly 10% of the population is Christian, the two faiths have always coexisted. Lately, though, tensions have spiked, with sometimes tragic consequences. They're a community reeling from repeated attacks, especially over the last 10 months. Last May, the Coptic Church of the Virgin Mary in the poor Cairo neighborhood of Imberba was set ablaze. Now Egypt's Coptic Christians are divided between fear and resistance. I'm not worried about anything, anything happening in the street. I'm not worried. God exists. He's above everything. If we're afraid, we'll never go out of our houses and we'll never do anything. Many people are thinking about leaving the country. Christians were the majority in Egypt, already practicing their religion long before the arrival of Islam. Yet they claim they've been systematically persecuted throughout the years. And their situation has not improved with the revolution. Now they're the focus of the Salafists' ire. And with this, there's a rise in interreligious tensions. The country has been like this for 7,000 years. We know about Pharaonic history and Islamic history, but what about Coptic history? I feel we are oppressed and deprived of our rights. What happened to those who burned the church? What's happening with the investigation? Not far from the church in this neighborhood where Christians and Muslims live side by side, Hanan is also asking this question. And it's a question that evokes painful memories. Her husband was stabbed and burned during the attack on the church. I do not trust any justice except God's justice. We are persecuted because we are Christians. And it's because we are Christian we have to put up with a lot. What have we done wrong? My daughter is six years old and she can no longer say the word daddy. Salah was the church custodian. He leaves a 36-year-old widow and three children. 17-year-old Mina is the eldest. He writes his tributes to his father on social networking sites while denouncing the abuses that Christians here suffer. I want to die in my country. I will not leave my country for any reason. I do not want to leave Egypt. Others have chosen to enter politics. This 39-year-old Coptic lawyer is running in the elections as an independent candidate. Some say that we are negative people and that we do not participate in political life. See, I prove otherwise. It's our right to have representatives in parliament and to participate in political life in order to claim our citizenship, which is guaranteed by the constitution. One Egyptian out of every eight is a Copt, and they're more determined than ever to exist in a society where they feel targeted and abused. An ongoing challenge of the revolution will be to ensure every section of Egyptian society can live together in peace.
We are standing on the Gala Bridge and we're pleased to be in the company of Dina Zakaria, often a guest on the France 24 debate. Dina Zakaria of the Freedom and Justice Party of the Mosque Brotherhood. Your story is an interesting one. Um, not raised in a particularly religious fashion. Um, you started wearing the veil when you were at university. Um, uh, and why did you decide to join the Mosque Brotherhood? Okay, uh, first of all, at the age of 16, I decided to to have this kind of religious kind of life, religious style life. So when I get to university when I was 18, I decided to search around me who can help me to practice religion in a moderate way. So I get to know both Salafists and Muslim Brotherhood. But I decided to have the side of Muslim Brotherhood. I found that they have this global vision about how to practice religion. It's not only that it's a relationship, a relationship between you and guardian at home. No, you can practice religion with society doing social actives, activities oh. with people, um, uh, to be a real positive person. And your parents, how did they feel about it? No, at first they were really fear and worry about me because they felt that I'm going to face security threats. Of course, I couldn't tell them that I'm going, I decided to be a member in Muslim Brotherhood, but they felt that I'm doing something. So they were trying just to tell me, be careful. And I just tried to tell them, don't worry, I am trying to learn a lot about my religion. I want to be moderate. It's my my character. You say you say a global vision. Yeah. Does that mean, uh, for instance, a lifestyle, and that tomorrow, if the Muslim Brotherhood wins elections, if there's a Muslim Brotherhood president, that, uh, for instance, all the women on this bridge have to wear the veil? I'm always wondering why people from media are always talking about such kind of outlook. We are looking forward to make a real reformation according to uh, Islamic reference, you know. So to have this lifestyle, it doesn't mean that you have to oblige people or to impose such kind of thing. But you just will, we will just try to show people how to know a lot about uh, the religion in a moderate way. And how, how does... They are going to choose. They are going to choose what they want. We will not impose any ideas. We never did that before. I am a member for 17 years till now, so... And how does uh, the, uh, voting for the Freedom and Justice Party help the cause of women? Yeah, okay. Let me s tell you another fact that Muslim Brotherhood movement is the only movement who has these large numbers of women who are really activists in, in, in different fields. For many years, it's the only organization that has that number. Uh, so it's a challenge that we are representing. So uh, let me tell you another fact also. After we established the party, uh, the party sent me to European Parliament to be the only woman who is representing the party. So I was a spokesperson for, for the behalf of the party, which means that this party actually respects women's role and we believe in terms of religion that it's a must for women, for every woman to call for her rights, to participate in different fields. So that's what we believe. So we are going just to show that for people to make sure that they are going to call for the rights, women or men. Dina Zakaria, thank you very much. We're now at Media City and we're going to speak to another woman. I guess you could say an emblematic woman because hers is one of uh, the most talked about talk shows uh, in Egypt from on TV. Reem Maged, thanks for having us. Reem Maged, uh, your show is called Our, uh, It's Our Egypt. It's called, actually, it's called Baladna Bil Masri, which means our country in Egyptian, in Egyptian way, you know, women. Our country. Let me just ask you, uh, uh, as a leading female figure here, you've got one female presidential election candidate. You're probably only going to have, what, a handful of women who are going to get elected to parliament. Can women say it's our country, it's our Egypt? Definitely. The fact that we are not have, because if, if if we if we take this example, it means in it means that any of Egyptian citizens can say we are Egyptian because still we have lots of rights that we didn't get yet. Not only women in Egypt, so we are we can say and we will always say we are Egyptian and defending our. We, we saw, for instance, uh, there was a Facebook page dedicated to the fact that during the summer you did your show with short sleeves on. Uh, it must be tough to work as a woman in, in these circumstances where you're scrutinized in, in this way. 
No, but this is, but it's not the, it's not very common. This page is an, an, an exception. It's not uh, a way of, uh, of suffering that I'm suffering all, all, all the time. No, not at all. It's, it's a kind of, of uh, critique of crit critics that we are exposed to. One of them, this kind of critics. No, it's not, uh, so it's not a big deal for me, no. That's interesting, because what you're saying is, is that uh, uh, there's this sort of open debate. Have you noticed your shows existed, what, since 2008, 2009, uh, since January the 25th? Is anything game now? You can talk about what you want. It's like it's, ah, when you go to work in the morning, you don't have to be wor wondering, oh, I can't broach this subject. This is out of bounds. Unfortunately not. No. No, we are, we are keeping the same uh, battle. No. Self-censorship or censorship? Both. And what? Specifically? Uh... We started by uh, a censorship, and now there is a, a, a real, uh, a real pressures, direct and indirect. I mean, on the part of the on the part of the uh, the the, uh, the military that's in power. Yes, of course. Uh, directly, for example, me uh, personally was. Um, I can say it in French. No? Okay. Uh, convoqué devant le, le, le... You were called in uh, by the state prosecutor. Yes, exactly. Uh, this is um, uh, a small example. Uh, yet you're still pressing on and you're still talking about all the issues that matter. Sure. It's a battle. You can't, you can't resign. No. We are, we are keeping our, uh, our war. The struggle continues, and the struggle continues uh, in, in ways that are sometimes a bit surprising. Um, the revolution uncovering new talents, and uh, as you're about to see, uh, Egyptians discovering a new kind of television in one instance. Egypt's first post-Mubarak parliamentary election is providing plenty of material for the next episode of Bassem Youssef's TV show. We were making fun of people who are actually using money and food to buy uh, people's votes. So, uh, yeah, we, we were just like making fun of the election tactics in general. A new addition to the cast is Katham the Puppet, Bassem's latest comedy sidekick. أنا بقول لي بمد فترة من تخبيت لعشر سنين اللي جاي. كلها حوالي. عشان الشعب ده يلاقي احتياجات من أكل، شرب، سلع معمرة، وغير معمرة. وأراسف يا كرا. With his mix of satire and wit, his humor is breaking new ground in Egypt and across the Arab world, but it's also ruffling some feathers. So religion is a big taboo, of course. But we are, what we are trying to send the message that if you are a religious authority and you came down to politics, you should accept criticism because this is politics. You're not uh, holy, you're not uh, sacred. A heart surgeon by trade, Bassem's first step on the road to TV stardom began during the revolution. Appalled by the state media coverage of what was going on, he took video clips posted on YouTube and created a mock newscast. He spent $100 on a backdrop of images from the revolution and began filming video clips from his own home. There's so many lies in this uh, state-run TV uh, and they were just like uh, fabricating lies about the people in Tahrir. Uh, when I came back from Tahrir every time, every day, and I saw the TV, I was extremely pissed off. The format is modelled on Jon Stewart's Daily Show, who also happens to be Bassam's idol. Uh, John Stewart is a pioneer in this uh, political satire uh, genre. I mean, I've been watching him for the last uh, seven, eight years. The, um, the amount of research that he does, this, the, the intelligence by which he makes his shows are amazing. Bassem has a team of young volunteers to help him come up with ideas for the show. Passion and enthusiasm are the only qualifications required. I don't know these people. <laughs> I don't know them. 
Who are you? All right. They're coming here for the food. And of course, they all share an appreciation of irony. Mass communication. The arm is great. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the political turmoil Egypt's now facing, Basim is still convinced humor is the best weapon. For sure, how you get your message across, one of the defining features of the Arab Spring. As you can see uh, here, a bullhorn sometimes coming in handy. That's it for uh, this uh, special series devoted to Egypt's unfinished revolution. If there's one uh, uh, if there's one image that uh, we'll be bringing back with us, it's total strangers coming up to each other and willing to argue the point and engage with one another. From all of us, thanks for watching and keep watching our coverage of the Arab Spring here on France 24.